All right, so it is now 3 p.m. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Code Review Best Practices. Um, I apologize in advance. I, as some of us discovered during the break, I had to bring an ancient dinosaur of a laptop with me to this conference, and the version of Apple's operating system that does live captioning does not install in this machine. So I apologize in advance, but the slides are posted online, so you should be able to download and follow along if that's helpful for you. Um, my Twitter is xjmdrupal, and they're also in the session description on the session page. And just one other note before we get started. Is this mic picking me up? I feel like it's very far away. It's good? Okay. Um, I ask that people not take photos or videos of me for privacy reasons. That's what the orange lanyard means, so if you see it on other people, please respect that as well. So hi, my name is Jess. I'm xjm on drupal.org, and I'm a Drupal core committer. There are thousands of people who can contribute to Drupal core, but as a committer, I'm one of about a dozen people in the world who can actually accept changes into Drupal core's code base, making it a part of everyone's Drupal applications. This means that one of my primary responsibilities is reviewing other people's code. I'm also a member of the Drupal security team and a core release manager, so I actually create many of the releases that you can install on your sites each month. I'm funded full time to perform these roles for the community by a company called Agilina. We like to describe Agilina as a small but mighty government contractor. Um, we support awesome clients like NASA, the White House, the National Archives, and the Smithsonian, so it's cool. Um, I'm the only full time Drupal contributor at Agilina but other developers at the company are encouraged to participate in our Contribution Fridays with 15% dedicated contribution time. There are a couple other folks on the team who help with core, and the company also helps maintain several contributed projects as well. It's a great company with a positive work environment that puts people and health first, and we're also hiring. So if you're interested in hearing more, talk to me afterward, and I will, or you can find the booth in the exhibition hall downstairs. So the primary goal of peer code review is to catch bugs in new or changed code before it goes into production. Peer code reviews also help code health increase over time rather than declining. It's not just about the code quality though. Software code is written by human beings for human beings, so it's important that your software development process reflect that. Put simply, peer code review is also a tool for building stronger teams. By reviewing each other's changes as they're developed, you build a shared understanding of your code base across the team. And if done properly, it should foster open, productive communication. It can also help you create a sense of pride and shared ownership in your projects. Code review is also an excellent opportunity to mentor junior developers, some of the best onboarding there is. And finally, peer code review will help reviewers and authors alike write better code next time because reviewers learn from the process as well. Of course, if you want your code reviews to be positive experience for your team, you need to have a positive peer review culture. Now, I'm not big on emotional labor myself. I find it exhausting. But the peer code review process is one place where it really is worth putting in that extra effort to help everyone involved feel safe and supported. The most important is that everyone in a review should treat each other as equals. Start from a place of humility. Everyone brings their own knowledge, experience, and reasoning to the table. We do peer reviews precisely because it's difficult for us to catch errors or weaknesses in our own work. And that's true for the reviewer as well. In the years that I've had commit access to CORE, I've noticed that many contributors just sort of do anything I suggest without questioning it, which you'd, you might think would be nice, but actually, I want the author's thoughts on my feedback, especially if they disagree, because I make mistakes too. It's also important to have empathy for others involved in the review process to consider their needs and constraints. If something seems wrong or confusing, ask a specific question about it. This will help both of you understand what's going on. If something technically works but could be improved, phrase your improvements as a suggestion. And finally, when you and others disagree about something in the code, encourage others to explain their perspective. Even if something definitely needs to be changed, it's helpful to have misunderstandings and additional perspectives documented for future reference. So I structure my code reviews in three parts to improve the chances that they'll be well received by the code authors. 
I try to always start by thanking the author for something specific they did well. That helps them read the review positively and shows them that I'm aware of the work that's gone into their, their code change set. If you dive straight into asking someone to change this, that, and the other thing, it might seem like you've missed the big picture or the value of their work. Next, in my comments of specific lines or on aspects of the code, I try to provide references backing up my recommendations. Even if you as a reviewer have seen a certain problem a hundred times, the author may not have. So provide them with references to policy documentation, references to other code that's relevant or the like. Providing a reference helps the code author internalize best practices a little bit at a time and also sets a good example for other reviewers to follow so that everyone can learn from it. Finally, after I finished my detailed review, I close with a summary and an actionable next step for the issue. If I've given a lot of feedback, I'll highlight what I think are the most important concerns or issues to address. It's always good to help contributors understand what the path to done is, and that starts with an actionable next step. Now before I get into any more specific advice about the technical aspects of code review, I need to explain some background concepts from psychology. Of all the tools we use to do code review, our brains are the most important. So it's important to understand the limitations on our brains and how we can enable them to do their best work. The first concept to introduce is that of decision fatigue, which simply stated is that after we make many decisions, our ability to make additional decisions becomes worse. If you've ever come home after a long day and found yourself like staring into the refrigerator as if it held all the answers, or been completely overwhelmed by the array of choices in a US supermarket. This is probably what's going on. We make hundreds of decisions every day. Many of them are completely trivial. What to say or text at a given moment, what to have for breakfast. But when you make many of these little decisions in a row, your brain gets fatigued. And symptoms of that fatigue can include feelings of exhaustion or mental fog, impulsiveness, and procrastination or avoiding making further decisions. And code review involves a lot of decisions. For every single line, we decide whether the code is right, what other side effects it might have, whether there's a better way. Another important concept I want you to think about is directed attention fatigue, or DAF. When we have to focus on a single task, like when we do a code review, our brains have to suppress stimuli from external distractions. Now, the distractions can be entirely external, background noise, the kids, the pets, messages in Slack from your coworkers. But they can also be internal, random unrelated thoughts passing through your minds, feeling hungry, worrying about the bills. Finally, the distractions can also come from the code change set itself. Code style errors, bugs in nearby code, and so forth. And that's something we'll talk about more later on. Unfortunately, the mechanism in our brains that allows us to push aside these distractions to focus on the task at hand gets fatigued and overused. And symptoms of that can include restlessness, irritability, and apathy, none of which are good for your health or for fostering a positive review culture. Directed attention fatigue can also cause you to miss social cues, which can make it harder to communicate empathetically with the person whose code you're reviewing. And finally, it can cause misperceptions, confusion, impulsiveness, and poor decision making, all of which will lower the quality of your code review. It's also worth pointing out that distractions are an accessibility issue. Directed attention fatigue does affect neurotypical people, but it can be compounded for folks with ADHD. There's actually been research that shows the same mechanism in people's brains is stressed in both directed attention fatigue and ADHD. The important difference, of course, is that directed attention fatigue is a temporary condition that you can recover from. It takes time for that mechanism to recover after it's been stressed which is probably one of the reasons a lot of folks with ADHD use a strategy of taking sh frequent short breaks with a timer and so forth. Overall, you should treat distractions in the workday and in the code change set itself as accessibility and inclusivity concerns. This is something that I'm trying to get better at in my own reviews as well. Keeping the you know little asides out of it. It's so tempting to narrate and put my thoughts in the review, but it's not actually helpful for everyone reading it. So with that context, Let's talk about some research that's been done on how different factors can increase or decrease the effective of our COVID development processes. Um, references for these are in the 
the speaker notes and the slides which I've tweeted and are on the session page as I mentioned. So the key concept to understand here is that of defect detection. This means of the existing potential bugs or flaws in a code change set, how many are actually identified by a given process. Higher is actually better because it means you've found more bugs before they can actually become bugs. And early defect detection is really valuable. It's much better to find a bug before it ships. Seems obvious, right? According to one source that I looked at, even low impact bugs are twice as costly to fix once they're in production. And a critical bug can be as much as 100 times as costly to fix after it's in production. For Drupal core, the equivalent of that being in production is probably after it's been released in a tagged version of Drupal. And then something you might not have expected. A formal code review with multiple reviewers is on average twice as effective as automated testing for defect detection. This is actually amazing that people simply reading the code are twice as good at finding bugs as computers that can run it. Of course, combining both is even better. And I have some statistics to illustrate this that compare the effectiveness of peer code review with different kinds of quality assurance. First off, a word about unit tests. Um, they can catch anywhere from 15 to 50 percent of bugs within a change set or 30 on average. Um, I didn't show the error bars on the slide, but that's because unit tests were the only tool which, with such unpredictable, inconsistent results. And it varies so widely because the usefulness of unit tests depends on the scope and encapsulation of the change set. Furthermore, misusing unit tests in place of integration tests can lead to a very high rate of false positives and a lot of technical debt, all of which are distractions. So use with caution. Static analysis is pretty great and can catch 33% of potential defects, more actually than typical unit or regression tests. We recently started doing static analysis on all Drupal core issues and it's been awesome. Integration tests, finally, the most effective automated tests catch 35% on average. So as an aside, when in doubt, write an integration test over unit or regression tests. Now, compare all of that above to the, the formal peer code review process with multiple reviewers, which will catch 60% of defects. Again, this is peer code review by itself before it's combined with any of these other tools. Now finally, for context, I've also included a statistic for the effectiveness of large beta tests with over 1,000 users. Those beta tests identify 75% of defects in code on average. Just think of all the time and cost it takes to set up a beta test of that scale, not to mention all the, quote, free work that you get from your beta test participants as well. A formal code review costs a fraction of that, but it still might find as much as 80% of the same stuff, even if for some reason you didn't have automated testing at all, which I certainly hope you did by the time you got to having a thousand person beta test, but anyway. So like I said, those statistics are about using each tool by itself. But peer code review is also even more effective when combined with other strategies. If you combine design reviews, automated testing, QA, and peer code review, it can increase the defect detection rates to over 90%. So you should still write integration tests and still use linting and static analysis tools. And in fact, you should have all of that run before your peer reviewers even start looking at the code. That'll reduce the number of defects in the code before it gets to your peer reviewer, which in turn will make them more effective. So in summary, peer code reviewers are your most cost effective resource for code quality, so you should optimize for them in your development process. Well, so how do you do that, you're thinking? How do you optimize for a good review? I'm gonna spend the next several sections exploring how you and your team can work together to optimize for code's reviewability. So in the graph on this slide, um, the, it compares the defect density found in a review, which is the y-axis, the vertical axis, with the number of lines of code in, in the review set, which is the x-axis. Higher in defect density, again, is a good thing here. It means that you're catching more of the bugs that already exist in a piece of code early, before the code goes into production. Lower defect density, on the other hand, is bad. Now these chain sets out here with 700 or 1,000 lines of code of them they didn't have fewer bugs. They didn't even have fewer bugs per line. It, they just completely overwhelmed the reviewer so that the reviewer couldn't see the bugs in them anymore. It has a pattern of exponential decay, 
reviewers are really good at spotting bugs in small change sets, but the reviewer's effectiveness drops off rapidly as the size of the change set increases. So why does this happen? The reason is that reviewing too many lines of code at once can cause both decision fatigue and directed attention fatigue. So the best way to fix it is to reduce the number of lines of code under review. Split the changes into smaller logical pieces. Fewer lines mean to review means fewer decisions and fewer distractions. Based on the data, it's best to review up to 200 lines of code at a time. Note that this includes removed lines as well because you need to also read those to ensure that the change is correct and that there aren't regressions. So you add the absolute values of the added and removed line codes to get the total. So I've got an example since that probably didn't make much sense. Um, so the change here added 113 lines and deleted one. So that's 114 total lines of code under review. It's a good change set size. And in general, you should aim to never review more than 400 lines of code at a time. Change sets that are that large should be reserved for simple one-to-one -one replacements of one thing or the like. For example, replacing uh, deprecated functions usages across your code base. So here's an example of problematic change set solving also from another core issue. Um, it was a bit much. I felt like physically exhausted every time I got more than about halfway through. And sure enough, I checked and the scope of the change set was just too darn big. I'm only showing the very bottom of the diff on the slide, th but this issue changed 94 files with 229 insertions and 201 deletions. So that's a total of 430 lines of code under review. Over our recommendation, and that's part of why the review was tiring for me. Another thing that helps is to never spend more than 60 minutes doing code review at a time. Now note that 60 minutes is sort of the recommended maximum and won't work for everyone. You might find that 30 minutes at, at a time works better for you, for example. And between those 30 or 60 minute reviews, you need to take breaks so your brain can recover. Deal with distractions that have come up, but also just let your brain rest. Some folks may find that they work better with cycles of 20 minutes of code review followed by a short break, and then after those several cycles, one longer break. So speaking of distractions and code review, <laughs> let's talk about handling nitpicks. Nitpicks themselves are trivial, but how you handle them is actually a really important part of your code development process that does need to be discussed. So to me, reading code style errors is like watching a speaker who has something stuck in their teeth. So imagine, I guess in an unmasked setting, you have to use your minds here, a little fleck of something green stuck right up here. It has no bearing on what's coming out of my mouth on what I'm saying, but you still might not be able to concentrate on my words if you're distracted by that one little thing. And that's how I feel when I review a change set that has code or documentation style errors. They are minor, unimportant, and utterly distracting. I can't see your code if your white space is messed up. I don't understand your inline comments if they contain grammatical errors. It is a real problem. Code style errors are distractions that increase your directed attention fatigue and make the review harder on the reviewer. Trivial decisions about fixing them will also add to decision fatigue for both the reviewer and the author. But on the other hand, nitpicky reviews are also really discouraging to code authors. They spend hours or days fixing something, and so then instead of evaluating their design or appreciating their work, you get lost in the distractions of formatting issues or spelling errors. It can seem oppressive or like a lack of appreciation for the contributor's work. So how do we fix the problem? On the one hand, code style errors get in the way of effective code review, but on the other, they are the least important thing about a change set. The answer is to use automated tooling that runs immediately every time you submit a code change before your peer reviewer looks at the issue. Instead of dozens of tiny nitpick decisions, you have one binary decision. Did it pass automated coding standards checking? Now the Drupal community has now spent nearly a decade improving, incorporating automated coding standards checking into core process and also actually making core comply with its own coding standards, which is another problem. And it's, it's kind of difficult for me not to be melodramatic about just how much this has made things better. Um, our community health is, has improved so much as a result of this and it makes us so much more focused on what actually matters. And here are some of the automated tools that you should use. PHPCS, PHPSTEN, CSpell, 
ESLint, StyleLint. Core has a script that will automatically run a number of linting checks, including these tools, on the code base, both as part of Drupal.org's automated testing and as a pre-commit hook that committers like myself have run before we make a commit to it. You can also configure jobs for these tools using GitHub Actions, GitLab CI, Drupal CI for Contrib, or your own continuous integration or QA tooling. I won't go into detail about how to set them up. There's information on the internet about them, um, but you should be able to find the list again in my sites. I strongly encourage everyone to use these tools for both contributed and client projects. In each case, uh, Drupal already provides a full rule set that you can use to make your project compliant with Drupal standards, or you can also, you have the option of writing your own rule set if, if you work for an organization that mandates its own coding standards. Now, automated tooling can't catch every single kind of nitpick type problem. I have an example here of a minor documentation fix where someone should have used the at C PHP doc tag, but didn't. Fortunately, GitLab makes it super easy to deal with this kind of thing with the insert suggestion feature. Um, you just highlight the lines that your nitpick is about in, on the merge request, click the insert suggestion button, which is the leftmost one in the widget, this little one with a carrot and an underscore sheet of paper, tiny thing that no one knows what it is, and then, then edit the snippet in line in the box. So you're basically just hand editing the code for their merge request in a way that they can accept with a single button click. It's great. Um, it saves you time having to write out an entire sentence saying, oh, this should use an at use statement. And it saves them time having to make this nitpicky change that's not really that important in the big, greater scheme of things. So with all that background information, let's talk about how we can optimize our change sets so that peer reviewers can do their best work. Remember, human peer reviewers are the single most efficient thing you have to catch early issues early, safely, and cheaply, so you should lean into that. There's something quite important and magical about your peer reviewers. They are your first insight into what experience someone is going to have maintaining this code years down the line. If the reviewer can't follow your code just by reading it, Chances are that's going to happen again in the future when someone else looks at it. So optimize for readability and reviewability. It's essential that someone in the future understand the code easily, and actually it might even be you in a few years. You don't want to find yourself saying, ah, did I write that? It's much better to say, ah, thank you, past self. That was very clear. And I've had both reactions to my own old code. I'm sure many of you have as well. So while smaller chain sets are easier to review, it's also definitely possible to take it too far. First and foremost, you shouldn't ever commit something to your main branch that leaves it in an unshippable, incomplete, or broken state. If you were using Drupal about 10 years ago and wondered why Drupal 8's release date ended up being years later than was initially promised, it's because of this right here. We didn't keep the code base in a shippable state, so we ended up with hundreds of critical issues blocking Drupal 8's release. We no longer do that, which is why we have scheduled release dates now, and it's fantastic. Another mistake to make is making the diff smaller by separating out test coverage or documentation. This isn't a good idea because tests and docs are actually an important part of understanding the change. A lot of times I read the test coverage to understand what the issue is even really about, and a diff that's missing them isn't optimized for reviewability. It affects the immediate experience for the reviewer, the shippability of your code base, and the usefulness of your Git history. So keep it together. Finally, scope creep. You're editing a file, and you see something else that's wrong just a couple lines above. So you think, why not fix that while I'm here? The problem with this is that it adds distractions for the reviewer and forces them to think outside of the context of the primary change. It also creates an ever-expanding set of changes that need to be made in the issue, blurring when it's really done. Reviewers can make this mistake too, by the way, when reading moved lines or context lines in the diff. I've done that myself many times before. So instead of fixing that one little thing near your changes, get in the habit of filing separate follow-up issues for unrelated problems that you spot when you're looking at something. Sometimes you'll get a reply from a code author that a certain pattern you pushed back on is used elsewhere in the code base, even if you've documented a real technical issue with that approach. 
Some code authors take their response to your feedback too far and change all the other instances of the same pattern across the code base. It happens so often, you'd be amazed. And then others will push back on your pushback and they'll want to add code that's using a known bad pattern just for consistency with the rest of the file. Both of those things are the wrong approach. File follow-up, write new good code now and fix old bad code later. You also shouldn't even fix out of scope things on the same line as the one you are changing. When I was first working on core in 2011, this was a mistake I personally made a lot, thinking, oh, well, we're updating this line. We might as well fix this other thing with it too. Bad idea, don't do it. It's still scope creep and it will still make your peer reviews less effective. And here's why scope is relevant even on a single line. Some kinds of changes are easily scannable if you use a word diff. Replacing all instances of a misspelled word, fixing one coding standard, or replacing a deprecated method with a new one. All of these changes are easily reviewed with git diff dash dash color dash words. If you have not used it before, it will change your life, I promise. So in the diff on the slide, uh, a change is standardizing how the word writable is spelled throughout the code base. Now let's say that I thought of a better way to word the method doc block that says whether this is a writable storage. It could be tempting to say, well, I'm already changing this line, so I might as well improve the rest of it. The problem with that is that it completely changes the kind of review that's needed. If the original change set is only a couple dozen instances of standardizing how writable is spelled, that's very easy for me to just scan. It'll only take a couple minutes. However, if we suddenly add a bunch of rewritten documentation, I have to use different parts of my brain. Instead of just checking the spelling, I have to think about the whole sentence. Is the new version actually an improvement? Is it grammatically correct? Are there other errors being introduced? What's more, I'll now have to actually read the entire method to determine whether the new documentation is accurate. When we're just checking spelling, I don't actually have to review the rest of the code, right? Suddenly, what was a two-minute review is instead going to take 20 or more, depending on how many lines we decided we wanted to improve. The approach to take instead is to get this simple change in first, the spelling fix, and then have a follow-up for other improvements. Note that git diff color words can also take a regex to specify what should count as a word break for the purposes of the diff. I find that specifying a pattern of a single dot is really useful for replacing things like one function call with another. So the example on the slide is from a recent change we made to adopt the PHP 8 stir starts with function. The original merge request for this lumped together adopting stir starts with, stir ends with, and stir contains, and replacing all the various other string functions that PHP has that could possibly be replaced by those. It changed like 300 lines, which meant 600 total added and deleted lines to review. And there were nine or 10 different patterns for replacements in there. I spent like two hours trying to review it, and I felt like my brain was melting before I could finish. It was a clear sign to me that it was not well scoped. And so despite the fact that other people had, who had created this patch, you know, just using an audit, probably a PHP storm automatic replacement, you know, it took them for like five minutes to make the patch. Um, I ended up splitting the issue up myself with git add dash P into five separate issues so that it could be handled in a more manageable way for myself and other reviewers. So after it was split up for the first step, we had to review, th that's, again, this is just the one function, stir starts with, review th three things. Does the original code have a check for whether stir cost is zero? Are the comparison operator in zero removed? And does the updated code have the correct logic? If originally it was checking that the position was not zero, then the function should be negated. Otherwise, if it was checking that the position was zero, then it should be a direct replacement for stir cost call. So now there were three decisions I had to make about each line rather than a dozen. And there are only 100 lines to review rather than 600. Both of these things improve the reviewer's ability to give a good review and decrease the time that this change set will be stuck in the queue fighting merge conflicts. And indeed, the first issue was already, been, was already committed long ago, the second step also committed long ago, and the third one's in progress now. So now let's talk about the most important questions to ask during a a peer code review. This is probably like the main content of the session, if anything is. The first thing you should always do is ask yourself if we should even be making this change in the first place. For Drupal core, 
There's a corollary to that, which is that maybe this shouldn't be a core change, but should rather should be handled in contrib. There can be pressure in open source to merge a change because other contributors have done the work. But unfortunately, there really are changes that make the application worse. One example of this is that we get a lot of requests for specific configurations and new options to be added to the core user interface. Sounds great, right? More features. Except that more elements, the more elements that are exposed in the user interface, the more the usability and accessibility tends to decline. Additional things in the page, also distractions. The second question is sometimes the only one an inexperienced reviewer might know to ask. Does the change completely resolve the issue without regressions? The without regressions part is important, and it means that anything that might introduce behavior changes, like a bug fix, should also be manually tested. Now the third question is whether the code quality is better after the change than before. Generally, a change that decreases the quality of the code base should only be made temporarily in certain critical situations. For example, when we do a security release, we'll often add duplicated code instead of a new API in order to reduce as much as possible the risk of any theoretical custom code breaking downstream due to naming or subclassing issues. After the security release goes out, we file a follow-up issue to add the proper correct new API in a minor release. So there's a temporary drop in code quality, but then an increase in, in the next minor. Note also that this says better and not perfect. If something seems like it's gonna get stuck in analysis paralysis, refocus and ask if the proposed change is at least better than the current state or not. Fourth question, does the change set meet standards for usability, accessibility, testing, and documentation? These four categories all co correspond to what we call the Drupal core gates. For each of these categories, Drupal core has the minimum requirements that must be met specific accessibility testing that should be done, specific test coverage and manual testing that is included, specific types of documentation that have to be added, and so on. And finally, is it the best fix we can come up with right now? This can be a harder question to answer, especially for someone who's newer to the application that's under review, but having multiple peer reviewers really increases your chances of finding optimizations and writing cleaner code. I always really value working with peer reviewers who identify unnecessary API surface, especially, because a smaller API surface makes the code cleaner and easier to understand, reduces the chance of regressions being introduced later, and reduces maintenance needs. So that's just one example of the kind of thing that falls under that last one. Now I have some final tips about how to do a peer code review. Most of the rest of my presentation is on the internet somewhere, uh, either as someone else's work or mine, but then these are just things like, I didn't talk about that and it's important, so that's what these are. First bit of advice, pay attention to the bigger picture of what's being changed. To really understand a change, you need to understand the API it affects. Read the whole method, look up the callers, trace the call stack in your IDE or API documentation, or even step through it in a debugger until you understand the bigger picture of what's going on. If you only review the code in its own context, you might miss something important. Recommendation number two, grep, or searching the code base. After drupal.org and Git itself, grep is the tool I use the most in my code reviews, by far. I grep for a huge range of things and probably something in at least two thirds of the issues that I review for core. If I don't understand something or it looks funky, I grep. I check for other places in core that the same pattern is used or isn't. If I th think it's fixing only one instance of something and I suspect the same bug might be present in other APIs as well, I grep. If I wanna compare what the author is doing to other uses of the same API, I grep. Be curious and think not only about the code in front of you, but of the code base as a whole. And for my final recommendation, be curious about why something is wrong in the first place. So many people just go to fixing a bug without stopping to say, but how did this break? If there's dead code, unused variables, incorrect documentation, strange bugs, it really is looking in, worth looking into how it got to be that way in the first place. For example, if you delete dead code without understanding how it became dead code, you might be removing the last evidence of an unreported regression. 
If you don't understand the history of the context of an issue, you can inadvertently make it worse. The best tool for learning the history of a line is git log capital L. A lot of people know about git blame, but more often than not, git blame will not give you the information you need. A few months back, I had someone come to me to ask me to clarify a to-do comment in code related to an issue I had never even seen before because they saw with git blame that I was the last one who had made a commit that changed that line. Now, in reality, all I did was commit a patch that did a bulk update of all the drupal.org URLs in the core code base so that they wouldn't cause redirects. That was the, that was the only thing I committed. Now, if the contributor had used git log L instead, it would have been clearer. And I have an example of git log at all for that exact change on the slide. Now you can't always just stop there because git isn't great at tracking lines when they're moved between files. So sometimes you might have to check out the commit right before the last one in, in that list, find out where the lines were moved from, and then repeat that same git log l process. But eventually you will get to the relevant commit and you can look up the issue that led to that commit, you can usually find your answer. So as a final summary, I've tried to reduce the most important considerations for code review into six points that fit on one easily iPhone photograph slide. You're welcome. First and foremost, foster a supportive review culture. Manage nitpicks with tooling like code style testing, static analysis, and merge request suggestions. Practice good scoping and optimize for read reviewability, which is a very difficult word to say that I said a lot of times wrong. Decide as early as possible whether a change should even be made. Ensure that all your changes either maintain or improve the code base's code quality, usability, accessibility, desk coverage, and documentation. And finally, ask yourself why issues exist to begin with. Look at the big picture and consider better alternatives for the solution. So that's all the structured content I have. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, here's a list of five references I recommend that anyone interested in this to topic read. The first two are the secondary sources I got all the research I presented for, well, most of the research that I presented from. Um, and they have, so, so in, you go to the website and they summarize and then they, they have references at the bottom for the primary sources. Um, the third is a resource from Google on their engineering best practices for peer code review. I found it was consistent with a lot of Drupal values, like I was nodding my head a lot and there were things that I had never seen written down in our documentation that I saw in theirs and was like, oh yes, I do that too. So it's, it's definitely worth a read. Fourth item up there is our handbook page on course automatic development checks, which also link references for all the individual tools like PHPCS and ESLint as well. So you can figure out how to set those up for your Drupal projects. And then the final link is drupal.org slash core slash scope, the core issue scope policy. Anyone in, who knows me knows I love this document. It's very detailed and it's going to seem totally ridiculous the first time you look at it, but it has actually really improved our core development process compared to how things were 10 years ago. It includes examples of good and bad issue scope and should be easier to understand after you've seen this session. Thank you. Um, so we have yeah, here we go. So let's keep that up on the screen and we have a uh, good eight minutes for Q&A. Seven minutes, sorry. Any questions? Are they gonna post the slides? They are posted. Great. They're on the session page and Twitter. Great. So we don't need to take a photo. But <laughs> you might also wanna take a photo. P people's workflows differ. Sorry, right, repeating the question for the recording. The, the question was, are you going to post the slides? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's very useful to, so, so actually the Google, the third resource on the other slide that you might wanna look at, um, I'll go back down, um, that how to do a code review document, go, Google has standards for like prefix all nitpicks with nit and so on and so forth. 
The practice that I used to use was I would like rearrange my dry data review back in the day so that, that you could see the things that were nitpicks here and the things that were important architectural questions that were up at the top and the questions that I didn't know the answer to and wanted their feedback on were at the bottom. Um, unfortunately, GitLab makes that sort of a process more difficult because it's not like you're composing this one long thing and then posting it to the issue. As you start to read and start to comment on lines in the diff, um, on, there's like an obscure setting to try to post it as a batch review, but I've found that it's very buggy and unstable and lost entire reviews before. So that's something to kind of, especially when Drupal.org is in this transitional state where um, you know, we, have, we have our Drupal issues, but then we have GitLab as well. Um, I, what, I'll, I'll, what I do is I'll sort of like post a comment on the issue that I'm starting a review that for my feedback sandwich, and then I'll try to indicate in each bullet you know, what kind, which type of category of feedback it is, and then summarize again in a separate comment on the issue. It's good. On Drupal.org right now, it's, it's a little bit messy and I haven't quite found the way, but it's, it's definitely a good idea to make it very clear because it's so easy if you're just going along, you give people floor plates and you, you ask, like, I have a question, is this like this? And then they think that your question is blocking or, you know, so definitely a good idea. Plus one whenever possible, especially for the longer the review is, the more comments there are, the more important it becomes to have that structure. Anyone else have a question? Yes, sir, in the back. So, so what do you recommend when the Right, okay. So, so when there's, there's, there's too many changed files, so, I mean, you have a couple of different options, right? So you can obviously add to your git ignore. You can try to look at it locally, right, using git locally. Um, it, it, I guess it depends on, are, are, is, are you reviewing someone's, like are they making, are they only doing a vendor update or are they um, making changes to code as well, right? So those are, those are two ki different kinds of things. Now we, we do do large vendor updates for core all the time. Um, we, our NPM dependencies are actually packaged and shipped as files in, in Drupal core. Um, so we actually, we actually have to do these kinds of reviews for our process where they're like large dependency updates. And we actually have a whole process of, so we, we first we just audit what's being updated by Yarn. Um, we'll look and see, okay, it's fixing X, Y, and Z security vulnerabilities. We'll glance and see if anything is re related to anything that could be relevant to us. Then um, we have some assets in core that are built assets um, that are built by the NPM dependencies. And if those built assets are changed as a result of the change to the NPM build, that means that we need to look at those assets and make sure, first of all, that a security issue isn't being introduced or that there isn't some sort of API change affecting us that we might need to take account for. And so then we actually have a sort of complicated process right now where we unminify the built assets, do a diff of them, reminify it, and then that's the sixth step of it. Um, but it, you know, depending on what you're reviewing, um, you know, it's, it can be helpful just to like, you know, do the vendor updates as a separate commit or just like do, use, use command, like command like git has infinite options for excluding directories, looking at only one file. Um, I, I, switch, I switch back and forth all the time between the graphical user interface that, that GitLab or GitHub provides and the command line for that reason because there's, the, the, I mean, there's just so many options for how to so many commands. Like if you want to review the changes only to one file, git, you can use your normal git diff with like between whatever and whatever, and then a double dash, and then the full path to the file, and it will show you the changes to that file only. You can use strategies like that for anything where it's related to a vendor update. I'm not sure if that's the, what you were getting at. Is, is, did that sort of cover you were addressing, or did you have a different kind of large change? What's that? All right, um, we have a few more minutes left. I'll give one last chance for, qu chance for questions. So 
that a question? Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming.